Hey everyone, it's Jeannie here, and today I am honored to be joined by an incredible man of God, senior pastor of the Christian Cultural Center, a mega church in my hometown, Brooklyn, <laughs> author, respected leader in the community and in the United States at large, Pastor Dr. A.R. Bernard, thank you so much for chatting with me again. It is my pleasure always to be with you, Jeannie. You know, it's Black History Month, and I couldn't think of a better person to talk to, to celebrate Black history, to talk about the Black community in 2021 than you. So thank you so much. Well, I, I, I don't see myself as the authority, but I've lived through it, absolutely, especially as an Afro-Latino. <laughs> right. And I appreciate your voice, you know. Um, there are people who are just representatives of the Black community because of their ethnicity, and there are people that are leaders and mentors and uh, people that the Black community can really look up to, and that's how I see you, and I always have, and I'm just so grateful for the work that you do in the community at large. Well, thank you for those kind words. Um, you know, I, I often what we do comes out of the experience that we've had and how it has shaped and informed us. And I would say the Black experience in America has been part of uh, what has informed and shaped who I am today and how I think. Yeah. So today I wanted to talk to you about the Black church. I know this is something that's on your heart as well. Um, maybe we can start a little bit with uh, some of the history of the black church and then we can actually talk about what's what it is currently and where it's going. Wow, yeah. Well, you know, we're looking at and people ask me, you know, you you call yourself African American. Uh and I have to explain because I was born in Panama. I am Panamanian. My yeah. my father was white Spaniard and my mother a uh, black descendant of Africans who were brought to the Caribbean and Central America. You know, so when I think about um, blackness and black identity. I'm talking and thinking about the uh, African diaspora to both North, Central, and South America. You know, that whole displacement, that whole experience. So that is how I identify as such. So I am essentially, like I said in the beginning, Afro Latino yes. because of my roots in, in, in Panama. Um, but it's unfortunate that, you know, uh, we live in a world that forces us to have to uh, not necessarily choose, but sometimes defend or navigate uh, identities. You know, uh, right. Dr. King's uh, speech that says he hopes that one day we'll ju be judged not by the color of our skin, but the content of our character. And we still have a long way to go. We, we you know, we've, we've made some progress in the last 50 to 60 years in America and around the world, but we still have a long way to go. So let me start out by saying that black people are not monolithic. You know, um, it, we're very diverse, all different shades, textures of hair <laughs> and facial features, you know. And uh, in our church, when we say that we're a multicultural church, you know, becoming more and more racially uh, diverse because each church is contextual and reflects the community or should reflect the community that it's in, you know, but we have people from Central America, South America, uh, Caribbean, uh, Latino, uh, from Africa, from Asia. It's quite a mixture of people of, of color. So the, the black community, if we can use that term, you know, is not monolithic. It is quite diverse. And what is true for the black community as a whole is also true for the black religious, religious experience. Uh, it is not monolithic, you know. However, the, the, the black church in its many distinctive expressions is a significant part of the American experience, you know, and it, it has impacted the spiritual, social, uh, economic, educational, and the political life of America which we can you know, see very clearly looking back at the civil rights movement and how it has influenced and shaped laws and policies and changes, uh, structural changes within the American system and American society. So, you know, again, uh, it's a very diverse uh, experience and it includes many black denominations. 
in fact, uh, according to recent statistics, 80% of the black community attends uh, what would be considered black churches or black denominational churches from the, uh, uh, the AME, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, right to the Church of God in Christ, the church that I was ordained as a minister in, you know, uh, and 14% actually attend what would be called white evangelical churches uh, in America. So we're, we're spread out, it, it's quite diverse, but tends to be quite consistent. So when you read or hear of some of the analyses um, based upon data accumulated by Bonner Institute and some others, you know, uh, it, it doesn't fully reflect the, the black church experience because it's very specific in terms of its experience here in America, you know. So with all of its various expressions uh, and, and differences, you know, uh, it, it, it is very diverse. Um, as I was saying, you know, it was a, a Pew Research study that I was referring to uh, about the 80% of black Americans identify as Christian and 53% of them uh, as historically black Protestants, you know. So the study also found that, that African-Americans, interestingly enough, are, are measurably uh, more religious than the overall U.S. population. Yeah, uh, I actually was gonna ask you about that. Yeah, and that includes- Why do you think that is? Well, I, I, it includes levels of, uh, of church affiliation, church attendance, uh, the regular practice of prayer and, and the importance of religion in, in, in one's personal life and in one's family life, you know, um, all of that is very real and measurable. And I think that that stems from the African worldview, because when Africans were brought to the Americas as slaves, they brought with them a worldview that was already established within African culture. And that is a worldview that embraces the, the sacredness of the universe, of, of creation. Uh, that's why, you know, beliefs in uh, um, what they call ancestral worship, but it's actually ancestral respect, all right? Okay. Because when you dig deep, and sociologists have found this into African culture, that essentially, regardless of practices, and traditions, they all believe in one, what they call Father God. So the sacredness of, of the universe, the sacredness of creation was an underpinning uh, for their conversion to Christianity. Remember, it's when they came to the Americas that you know they converted to Christianity uh, for the most part, but the underpinning of that was this worldview of the sacredness of, of the universe. So it, you know their conversion during slavery and, and after slavery uh, in America. And even in their conversion to Christianity, you know, Blacks created a sort of a parallel religious culture. They didn't just imitate white Christianity. Right, right, right. They infused, you know, some of their own cultural traditions and experiences and, 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 and practices and, 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 and customs uh, in their worship. So, you know, the Black church experience was very ecstatic, you know, the, the, the kind of um, spiritual experiencing of the presence of God that we see in the Pentecostal church and charismatic churches as well, especially Black Pentecostal and charismatic churches, you know, um, this was all part of its growth and, and development. They developed their, their own hymns, you know, uh, their own music style, um, preaching style, you know, their own styles of worship. And much of it, I have to say, if you look back at the history, was influenced by their captivity and slavery because some of the original hymns like Wading in the Water uh, were actually songs that signal, you know, certain events that were taking place in the community towards freedom or announcements of gatherings. So there's a whole study on the, 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 the black wow. gospel music and the hymns and how it related to slavery and the slave experience and some of the things that they were doing. So, you know, for, for, for some 200 years of slavery, you know, followed by another 150 years of legalized uh, segregation, 
you know, it made the black church part of the creative survival of blacks in America, you know? So, you know, they were able to relate to stories like the Exodus story because of their own captivity. They were able to relate to, you know, the Old Testament image of God as, as, as a, 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 a just avenger of injustice, a, a conqueror and a liberator. And, you know, and it, that influenced and informed the black struggle for freedom, justice and equality in, in American captivity. You know, uh, I got a chance to meet one of my, my heroes, uh, Professor C. Eric Lincoln. And uh, Professor Lincoln, uh, I was introduced to him because he wrote the, what I consider the definitive work on the nation of Islam. And it was called the Black Muslim Movement in America. He wrote it back in the 1960s and he presented uh, the nation of Islam, uh, not so much as a religion, but as a protest movement against the failure of the white Christian church to address the socioeconomic plights of blacks in this country. Mm -hmm. So he said, I, you know, in fact, he and I were going to write a book. We were meeting uh, with uh, Tom, Thomas Nelson publishers at the time, this is back in the 90s, and we were going to do a work about, uh, together about the history of, of, of God and humanity. And unfortunately, uh, Dr. Lincoln, you know, ended up passing. But he said something, he said the, the, the Holocaust of slavery and the notion of divine rescue uh, colored the, the theological perception of, of the black laity and of course the themes of, of black preaching uh, in a very decisive manner. And he was absolutely right in his assessment. So a lot of the sermons that were preached, you know, about black progress and black struggle and the suffering of Jesus, because we could, you know, I, and I'm saying we now, because I identify with that struggle, but they could identify with a, a, the suffering, death, and then the triumphal resurrection of, of Jesus. You know, it, yeah. it gave them a sense of hope in the midst of a hopeless situation. And they very quickly uh, translated you know, the whole hope of heaven to the hope of the here and now because of the Exodus story. So it was more than just waiting to get to heaven to get out of slavery. No, this God will make a difference in the here and now, the life that we now uh, experience. So, you know, to this present day, Black Christians still look for God's personal involvement in human history, you know, especially their experience in, in American history. We are still you know, believing that God is going to do something to continue changing the, the issues that we have to face. And the reality is that there's still inequities in American society. We're talking about, you know, racialized policing, uh, racialized criminal justice systems, uh, racialized immigration systems, uh, inequities in education, inequities in economic opportunity. You know, um, the whole and you, you, you got I'm, 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 I'm out the gate here, so I'll just keep going with this. Yeah, I love you know. it. <laughs> you, know. you, you definitely you're you're the one that's informed and that's what we want. We want to learn. We want to hear um, what it really is, you know, what the black church is has gone through, what what it is now. You know, what can we learn uh, from right. the black church right yeah, now? You know, the biblical declaration that all human beings are created in the image of God, you know, and a relationship with Jesus reconciles sinners back into the family of God, you know, that affirmed the humanity of, of a people who were once considered in this nation three-fifths human. We weren't considered fully human beings. And it's that issue of the humanity of Black life that has been at the forefront of the struggle. That's why when you think about Black Lives Matters, and I make a distinction here between Black Lives Matters, a philosophical revolution and movement that upholds the life and dignity of Black people, as opposed to Black Lives Matters, an organization that has a set of values and beliefs that I don't agree with, all right, cannot embrace, but I do embrace that philosophy, that idea uh, of, of that black life does matter. I mean, the whole movement of Black Lives Matter was to what? Reaffirm black humanity. Because when you see black people 
on your television, on the news, you know, being mistreated by law enforcement, those who are made uh, to protect, to serve and protect, you know, and, and you see that that is not an affirmation of black humanity. Instead, it's an affirmation of the myth that black lives are inferior. So, you know, I, that's what that BLM movement was primarily about these inequities and these conditions that exist to this day, you know, uh, for people of color. And there are those who are trying to deny, um, trying to deny that there ever was a, a, a black Holocaust or, or, or black enslavement, you know, like they're trying to deny the Jewish Holocaust. So it becomes convenient to erase certain aspects of history when, you know, it forces you to have to deal with it. So, you know, look, the frustration of Blacks, all right, uh, is, is because it, that frustration tends to translate into an aggression that's rooted in their alienation from the quality of life that they have seen experienced historically by the dominant white society. You know, as Christians, we embody this idea that man's brokenness and woundedness and our disordered uh, uh, way of thinking and living and being comes from our alienation from God, right? So that aggression that we see in the human person is an aggression, an aggression rooted in alienation from God. So we believe that reconciliation back to God begins to change that. Well, what is true in, 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 in our theology is true in the Black experience. When you have a people feeling that they've been alienated from a quality of life, you know, that alienation becomes the root for a certain aggression that comes out in different ways. Now, I'm not making excuses because there's still personal responsibility, but we have to put together social factors that influence and shape a person's experience along with personal responsibility. You, you know, so, yeah. you know, we, we may say that there are poor whites as well as poor blacks, and that's absolutely true. But the reality is that whites and blacks experience poverty differently because of structural racism. Even with yeah. that language, you know, GD, there are those who say, what structural racism? There's, there's right. nothing systemic. But whenever the system is designed in a way that gives advantage and benefit to one group over another because of the color of their skin, and not only gives advantage, but disadvantages that other group, you know, then there's something wrong in our systems and structures. And we have to take a look at that. And that's, you know, that's what we're trying to change. That's what we're trying to see, you know, different in American society. Because yeah, structural and, and racism, whether it's whether you call it structural racism or systemic racism is the word that we tend to hear of most. You know, it's a set of societal practices that that put one group in a better position to succeed while putting that other group uh, at a disadvantage. So the black church has been central to the civil rights movement. You know, Dr. King, he was a pastor, you know, uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church is where he was and then Ebenezer. So see, he was a pastor. And, and you know, I was in a meeting yesterday with his daughter, Dr. Bernice King, and we were talking about some of these issues of faith and prejudice. And she was saying that her father believed himself to be a pastor most of all. And when he, you know, emerged to the national scene, he saw himself as a pastor of the nation, a shepherd that, that was engaged in shepherding American society by appealing to America's conscience shepherding them into a place of accepting uh, Black people and Black life as human and accepting the dignity of that Black life and allowing it to assimilate. And of course, you know, the Black church played such a role in all of this. Yeah, and you know, I even think about everything that you're saying with all the uh, inequities and everything and still Black churchgoers have the strongest faith among religious groups in the United States. That to me is such an inspiring, I mean, I don't, I, it's hard to grasp. I mean, especially in America and especially among the millennials, you know, you get one thing that doesn't go your way and you're up in arms 
against God, and yet the black church is still among the most faithful of uh, believers. Yeah. And if I can speak to that, you know, you, you've got to see the black church as the only stable black institution that emerged out of slavery. It became the center of, of the black community and black life. You know, as W.B. Uh, E.B. Du Bois said, that, that the construction of the black church building uh, essentially was the first form of economic cooperation amongst black people. You know, during, and this was during reconstruction when they started to build churches. They built the church and then like 13th century Europe began to build cities and communities around the church as central. So the black church, you know, was that primary stable institution. In fact, the black church was the womb that gave birth to black schools, black banks, black insurance companies, uh, uh, affordable housing for black people, uh, black secular organizations and uh, came out of the black church. It nurtured black music, arts, entertainment, you know, uh, and it also became the center for the black community politically and political activity. You know, it was instrumental uh, over a period of time in elevating even the status of women, which is another issue that the black church took on. So the black church gave affirmation, it gave power, it gave a, a, a claim, it gave a sense of control, you know, uh, uh, it gave instruction, it gave direction, because the preacher, you know, he was the most educated uh, amongst the people within the early church experience, especially during slavery, all right? And he was the voice. That's why to this day, you know, the black church still expects the, 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 the pastor to opine on social issues, the issues that are affecting their community, especially the ongoing issues of race, race relationships and inequities within the society. So they look to the black church, they looks to the preacher to, to weigh in, you know, uh, on those things. That's why there's a difficulty, if I, may, if I may freely speak here, when you have blacks who attend predominantly white churches, evangelical churches, and the pastor does not show uh, any empathy or shows a lack of empathy towards the experience of those persons of color who are sitting in the pews, you know, feeling a part of the congregation, all of a sudden they don't feel a part anymore because they don't feel that their life matters within that context. So this has forced, you know, white pastors to say, well, wait a minute, I've got people of color here, you know, I've got to say something. Unfortunately, many of them don't know what to say or, or how to go about it. And for that matter, you know, get smart about it, get educated about it, you know, build relationships, you know, um, so that so that you can change that. And then there's some who, to the contrary, are not only showing a lack of empathy, but supporting things that are detrimental to the black community and and and, and black life. So I think that you know the the last uh, you know four years, especially in America. Uh, has forced America to take a look at some things that we thought were, you know, just okay. Just because we have a black president doesn't mean that racism ended. No, no, a change is not an event. <laughs> and the election of Barack Obama was an event. Change is a process that we go through over time and it has to be intentional. Uh, it has to be guided with wisdom and, and collaboration and, and humility and, and empathy. So those things are very, very important if we're going to see things move forward. That that right there is, was gold. I think um, uh, I think it's very helpful to break it down that way because there are churches where I mean, there's even a church um, in New York where the pastor is white and the, his church is predominantly black, and everyone was waiting to hear that kind of guidance that you're talking about because that's what happened in days of old you know the pastor was the one that was helping and leading the charge like mlk so that's incredible um what are some of the misconceptions of the black uh, the black church you know what have well, you heard that people that are not in the black church or a part of that culture what are some of the misconceptions well the, the the first misconception and the biggest one that that has always been a challenge for me 
is the the notion in the minds of of many white people and white society is that the, that black people are monolithic. That's why I started out with that. Yeah, that we're, yeah. We're not. We are Democrats, Republicans, liberal, conservative, uh, independents, centrist. You know, there are some for abortion, some against abortion, some for Israel, some against Israel. You know, so to paint us with a broad stroke brush as though we are all the same is wrong. Just like the white community is not monolithic. Right. You know, there's a great diversity within the white community and whiteness, which is not, you know, whiteness is not a color, it's a culture, you know, and a culture is a set of beliefs, traditions, ideas, and values, and 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 customs that shape and form the identity of a people, just like blackness is not just a, a color, it's, 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 it's a culture, you know, so we have to understand these things in order to move this conversation forward. So the first myth is that we're monolithic. We're all the same. We are not. We are very diverse in our opinions and our ideas and our feelings, you know, and our practices, et cetera. So I think it, it begins there. Um, I think secondly is to, dis, to debunk myths about black men that we are aggressive, that we are angry, that we, you know, impulsively react in violent ways to external stimuli. No, that is not true at all. We are very diverse in, 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 in our personalities, you know, just like any other race of people. You know, we're diverse in our personalities. You have some who are docile, you have some who are strong, you have type A personalities, you have, you know, you have it uh, from the whole spectrum. You know, so painting us with a white, uh, with, with a, a broad stroke brush rather, you know, is wrong. So I think those are the most important things uh, for me. We have aspirations and dreams and desires like any other human being. And I think it is common to every human being to desire the good because it was the good that we were moved away from when sin entered and we were alienated from God. And that good is something that all human beings desire. We may be sometimes confused about what good is and what good looks like because evil can disguise itself as good, but we still, you know, gravitate towards the good, the good for ourselves personally, the good for our families, the good for our communities, the good for our society, the good for our nation. Yeah, you know, some people think about black church and white church or Asian church or Spanish church and they think that shouldn't be how it is. Is there a need to diversify? Is there a need for the black church and the white church and the Asian church and all these different churches? What are your thoughts? You know, I, look, you know, the Christian Post did an article and I was quoted in the article of saying that we don't need to desegregate the white church. And I think we don't need to desegregate any church because it's not legitimate. The church should reflect its context. So if it's in a very racially diverse community, I think the church should make an effort to reflect that community. If it's in a predominantly white community, then it's gonna reflect that context because what are they gonna do? Bust some black folks in and bust some Latino folks in to create this, <laughs> right. this look? It, it's not authentic, it's not real. Mm. The church is always contextual. It depends on its context and it should reflect that context. I think what's important, and I said it, you know, uh, it, it, they quoted me in that article, that what we need is a new curriculum that every church, no matter what the dominant color of that church, race or, or ethnicity or class of that church, because racism is a tool used to reinforce classism. So we have to understand that. America didn't start out, you know, we're gonna be a racist nation because we, help, help, we hate black people. No, slavery was an economic system. It was then, it always has been. So in order to justify that economic system, there had to be an establishment of working class, labor class, and upper class. And that's really where it all begins. So if we revisit American history through the lens of class, we'll understand that race was simply a tool that was used to enforce classism. So we have to have a curriculum 
about the other, differences. A curriculum within all churches that helps us gain understanding because empathy is not something that can be taught. It's something that you experience, all right? If you're a normal human being, all right? It's something that you experience once you're exposed to someone's context and history. And when you get that context and history, then empathy can come alive inside of you. And you think differently towards that group and you think differently towards the other. So I think a curriculum is what we need in every church, not the desegregation of white or black churches or Asian mm. church. Mm. That's good. Um, you know, when a leader falls in a black church, I, I find that the process in a black church is often different than a process in another church or a white church. In particular, we, a big church leader from a white church, predominantly white church fell and was fired and that's it. But I mean, we've seen just in the past couple of years, you know, there's a different experience um, in the black church where the pastor usually is set down or he repents and then is restored. What is that difference that the black church and, and I know not everything is monolithic, like you're saying, but predominantly we do see that more. Why so? Uh, and, and what's the difference there? I, 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 you know, look, sociology was my major in undergraduate and we use the language tend to, you know, so <laughs> black people tend to be more forgiving and they've had to be considering the history that they've experienced here in America. We could not get beyond the captivity of slavery and the injustice perpetrated against us if we continue to be angry and hostile and bitter against those who perpetrated it. We could not be healed as a community. So we, based upon that experience, have had to embrace the power of forgiveness because forgiveness does not only liberate the one who, who, who injured you, it liberates you so that you don't carry that person's sin, the burden, the weight of that person's sin against you. We could not have progressed as a community if we'd continue to carry through unforgiveness the weight of the injustices perpetrated us against us by the dominant society in America. So we have been conditioned to forgive, you know, sometimes to a fault and consider that there are not many black leaders that we can look up to who champion our cause. So if there are not many black heroes and black leaders, we're not gonna be quick to throw under the bus uh, any of our black leaders because of some failing, because of, 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 of some problem that may have been created or experienced in, in their leadership. You know, So that has to be understood. And unfortunately, often it's not understood by the dominant society. Wow. It's, it's, it does not say we don't have standards, we don't hold people accountable. No, no. It's that we have developed over time and context a very forgiving heart and the fact that we don't have too many heroes. Yeah. You know, uh, we can learn from everyone. You know, the Black church can learn things from the white church, the Spanish church can learn things from the Black church. Or, or the Asian church, what would you, uh, if there was something in the black church at large that you're like, this is something that it would be beautiful of the body of Christ would learn from this culture, uh, this cultural experience of church, what would that be? Uh, let, let, let me say something because you use language there, the black church, the white church, the Asian church. These distinctions are social constructs. Right that came into being over the last 600 years of imperialism and colonialism, colonization. You know, prior to that, people were identified less by the color of their skin and more by their ethnicity, their language, their geographic location, their achievements as a culture and a people. So these are recent constructs in human history that were designed to separate, to, to, to alienate, to elevate one over the other. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we are now dealing uh, with the effects of the construction of, of, of those categories of, of people, all right? So we have to learn to think beyond that. And it's quite difficult 
within societies that reinforce it, perpetuate it all because the time. Of right. Because of structural racism. You know what I mean? Right. You know, uh, it's interesting now that when people are using the N word, uh, recently a, a, a musical artist was was held accountable for for using that word, and they began to pull his music, uh, you know, uh, from uh, their platforms. I think when we begin to uh, to hold people accountable, even if they use it as a term of endearment, even if they use it in a casual way, you know, uh, there's a problem with what's associated with it. So we can't justify or excuse it in any community out of a respect for each other and the black experience and what that word means. All right, in my family, you're not allowed to use it, plain and simple, not even as a term of endearment. I got seven sons, I got 24 grandchildren. They know straight up, mm -mm, we don't go in that direction, nor do we use language that's going to hurt, offend other people. We're not gonna do it, no matter who they are. So I think that we have to uh, carefully and strategically move beyond the things that are a residual of an experience in one part of American history. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to add about uh, Black History Month or the Black Church in America today? Well, let me point to a beautiful passage in Proverbs and it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And that word sick is more than just, you know, disappointed or discouraged. It means that you get to a point after the deferral of hope, you get to a point where your tolerance is no longer a part of the conversation. You're demanding change and you're demanding it now. And I think that that expresses the tone, the attitude, the feelings, the mindset of people of color and even uh, whites who are empathetic to the black experience. Because in the 1960s, we saw on our television sets, we, you, were, you weren't even born then, but <laughs> we saw on our television sets, fire hoses, all right, turned on children who were marching for civil rights, sweeping them and adults off their feet. We saw dogs, attack dogs, released on civil rights workers. It was an outrage to, for the American public and the world to witness something like that. But what happened? The nation was deeply divided. And those who believed in a, 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 uh, a system of segregation doubled down. But here it is 60 years later. And what happened when America now witnesses a police officer's knee on the neck of George Floyd. We have outrage again, but it was different. This time around, we saw a national consensus of moral outrage against discrimination by whites, blacks, Asians, every sector of society, every class of society. And that means we have come somewhere mm forward than where we were in the 1960s. And that speaks of hope. That speaks of the possibilities of change because now we're embracing this as a community, not just as one segment of community. And I think we need to continue to make it difficult for extremists on left or right, black or white, to exist in this country without being held accountable. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pastor Bernard. I appreciate you and your heart to really uh, bring unity um, in the Lord and, um, and offer wisdom, always such great wisdom. Thank you. God bless you. Always a pleasure, dear.